in our first person in the waiting room when I logged in at uh, 710, which uh, struck me as very early. Yeah, super keen. Want to make sure they get a spot. Yeah. Yeah. And since we're not doing anything, I will go ahead and let uh, let everybody in. Let's see, hello. I can find my, my cursor sometimes disappears, which it has done. And then when I'm screen sharing Keynote. Turn off those chimes too. Welcome everyone. We will get started at about 7.35. Um, and in the meantime, we've got a little slideshow of what's coming up, mostly in Science in the Virtual Pub, but also uh, um, that is a plug for our next temporary exhibit opening in late March or early April. We're expecting a pretty good sized crowd tonight. Welcome. We're, we won't get started for about 10 more minutes, so you've got a chance to get yourself a beverage or take a bio break or, or whatever. But uh, in the meantime, we'll have a slideshow um, scrolling through what's coming up, mostly in science in the virtual pub, but also other Darwin Days events, uh, which goes through this weekend, and um, information about our next. Uh, um, temporary exhibit at the Museum of the Earth is also on one of the slides here. And there's also information on um, how we'll uh, handle the Q&A at the end or after uh, Jason's talk. may well set a record tonight for number of participants if uh, all the people who registered actually show up, which is exciting. <laughs> and uh, um, we've added uh, most of the schedule for the rest of the spring. We are going to uh, take a summer break this year, um, but uh, most of the schedule is fleshed out through, um, through May. And uh, expect that uh, we'll have the rest of the schedule um, filled out uh, before too, too long. Science in the Virtual Pub meets twice a month on uh, the 
second Thursday tonight and the fourth Wednesday of the month. Uh, second Thursdays are at 7 Thursday, 30 p.m. Eastern time and uh, um, the uh, fourth Wednesday events are at six o'clock and pandemic permitting will be live streaming from uh, Buffalo's Resurgence Pub, but you'll still be able to catch them online if you're not in Buffalo or if in your, you're in Buffalo and you don't want to get out to Resurgence. As this is Science in the Virtual Pub, I'm going to go ahead and pour myself a beer, but no pressure. <laughs> so I will note what's going through with this coming up as we go through the slides this time. Uh, tonight is Jason Debre Dombrowski talking about moth versus president predator as part of our Darwin uh, Days events. And there is the rest of the schedule for Darwin Days, uh, some of which is now passed, some of which still lies ahead. Um, on Wednesday the 23rd, I will be speaking about uh, how changing energy sources changes history. On Wednesday the 23rd, we'll um, be uh, uh, talking about the Maid of the Mist uh, boat at Niagara Falls going electric. Um, then we'll have uh, Vandana Singh um, talking about uh, um, storytelling in uh, science communication. And uh, that got a little ahead of me, so I'll catch those later ones on the next time around. Um, we've also got a uh, new exhibit coming up, Six-Legged Science. Uh, opening in late March or early April. Um, we will also, after um, Jason's presentation, we'll uh, use um, peer-reviewed Q&A where you'll break into breakout groups to uh, craft questions that gives everybody an opportunity to speak and gives Jason a chance to catch his breath. Um, we will uh, probably before going to that um, address questions that came up in the chat during the talk and we will um, um, hold those questions until after the talk. And we will formally start about 7.35. So um, on Thursday, March 10th, we've got Outwit, Outlast, Outplay, which is about um, uh, deep microbial life a uh, uh, kilometer below the uh, ocean floor um, with Brandy Keel Reese. Um, we will also have an Earth Day event on April 27th. I should have made these slides pause a little longer. On May 12th, we'll have the Science of Puppetry um, with Annie Fresh Ozar, um, who is a, a Muppet maker. Um, and performer as well, um, and a former high school student of mine, which I think is super cool. Um, and I think uh, we'll probably go through the slides two more times, and that will get us up to about 7.35, and then we will uh, start tonight's session. I'll also note that I noticed in the registration, there's a lot of folks from my alma mater, Geneseo on tonight. So welcome to you all.
think I've hit all of the things on one of the go rounds or another. Um, so Vandana Singh is also a, uh, uh, is a physics professor as well as sci-fi author, as well as a uh, thinker about uh, climate change in interesting ways. Um, that is our brand new uh, graphic for the uh, coming exhibit. We'll actually give it one more uh, one more run through of the slides to get us to seven thirty five. As we're doing that, I'll note I'm Don Haas. I'm the director of teacher programming at the Paleontological Research Institution, and your host for Science in the Virtual Pub, which we began in March of 2020 and have been carrying on twice a month ever since. I'll also note that we are streaming live on YouTube. And you can find the recording instantly on our PRI YouTube channel, which we'll get into the chat before too long. And it'll also be on the uh, uh, Science and Virtual Pub Events page, which is actually right there, which we'll also put in the chat. Okay, it is 7.35, so I am going to stop sharing. My cursor will reappear. There are the rest of our events for um, Darwin Days and um, for my talk in uh, 13 days on the 23rd, I'll be talking about when we change, uh, how we get energy, we change history, and then, um, on March 10th, we will uh, hear from Brandy K. Reese, um, Outwit, Outlast, Outplay, a game of bacterial survivor in the deep, the survival in the deep ocean. And she studies microbial life deep below the ocean floor. On March 23rd, we will hear from Chris McKay, uh, who's the operations manager for the Maid of the Mist on their operations uh, switching to uh, fully electric boats. On um, April 14th, we'll hear from Dr. Vandana Singh um, uh, talking about uh, some, uh, some flavor related to climate change. She is a uh, physics professor and uh, science fiction author and very interesting person. Um, we'll have an Earth Day event that we're still figuring out on Wednesday, April 27th. And on Thursday, May 12th, we'll hear from Annie Fresh Ozar, who is a Muppeteer, talking about the science of making Muppets. And in um, uh, late March or early April, we'll open Six-Legged Science, our uh, new exhibit in collaboration with the Cornell University Insect Collection. And um, I am going to hand it over to uh, Jason, um, talking about Moth versus Predator, A Thousand Ways to Die, A Thousand Ways to Survive. Take it away, Jason. All right. Um, well, thank you so much for inviting me here. Um, just going to do my share screen, do that. Hopefully this works. Beautiful. All right. Uh, well, I can honestly say this is the first time I've given a talk where I can freely admit that I have a barley-based beverage right beside me. Uh, usually I have to conceal that fact. So uh, I think it's a special bonus to, to give this talk under those situations. Um, so basically, uh, today, I want to open this talk with a little bit of artwork here. Um, 
This artwork was done back in the 60s and 70s by a great naturalist and illustrator, Howard Coney Bear. And it is on the cover of a trail guide in Algonquin Park that covers um, ecology of hardwood forests. And what I really like about this illustration is it shows relative biomass, above ground biomass of animals in a typical hardwood forest. And you'll see that vertebrates are rather insignificant. The bulk of it is insects and most of that is caterpillars. And so with caterpillars, they, they're in such huge numbers that they're obviously really important in our ecosystems. So for instance, they're moving more plant biomass in our forests than anything else. So they're really important that way. They're affecting plant diversity. They are changing entire ecosystems. They're check, affecting soil fertility. But what we're gonna focus on tonight is some of the predators that wanna take advantage of this abundant food resource and the strategies that these moths and butterflies have to prevent themselves from becoming a meal. And to just illustrate how important caterpillars and moths are to these, uh, various, these various predators, just think of, of a lot of the passerine birds that you see in the summer. You know, a lot of the warblers and things like that. Right now they're in Central and South America feeding on food down there. And every year they make that perilous journey all the way north up here to feed on our abundant caterpillars. So obviously, we've got something going on here. So how we're gonna break it down is we're going to basically break it into three parts. We're gonna do a short little bit as to what exactly are Lepidoptera or Leps for short, butterflies and moths. We're gonna talk about sources of mortality, AKA the predators, parasites and parasitoids that feed upon our butterflies and moths. And then the bulk of the talk will be about some of the survival strategies that these Lepidoptera employ. So let's start with what the Lepidoptera are. So Lepidoptera, the butterflies and moths, it's an order of insects. It's the fourth largest order of insects globally. And uh, being a true insect, they have three main body parts, a head, a thorax, an abdomen. Uh, most of our moths have two pairs of wings, as well as usually six legs. And they're all covered in scales, deciduous scales. And it's not just the wings that are covered in scales. The whole body is covered, the antennae, the legs, everything is covered in these deciduous scales. And if you rub these scales off, what you're left with is a moth or butterfly with transparent wings and a shiny brown body, shiny brown legs, etc. Another character of Lepidoptera is that many species have what's called proboscis, a coiled tongue. So at rest, it's held coiled underneath the head, uh, usually tucked in right here. Here's one on this fertility butterfly where it's been extended out uh, to probe for various uh, fluids. Now those characters I mentioned apply just the adult stage and moths and butterflies go through a four-parted life cycle called complete metamorphosis. And it starts out in the egg stage. So here we're gonna use the forest tent caterpillar to illustrate these stages. So on the left, we've got the eggs, uh, the egg masses you can find this time of year. Actually, if you look around twigs for the little frothy hard masses, these eggs hatch into a caterpillar or a larva, uh, and the larva is the feeding stage of the organism. In some species, all the feeding is done by the larvae, and most it's, it's done primi primarily by the larva. Um, and the caterpillar eats immense amount of, of plant material typically, uh, so much so that they, again, as I mentioned earlier, move more plant biomass than everything else combined in our forests. So the caterpillar eats and grows, and eats and grows, and eats and grows, and eventually, it sheds its skin and forms a pupa. And sometimes around the pupa, in this case, it forms a cocoon, which is a silken structure to help protect it against predation. Eventually, uh, what you'll have is the pupa will develop and then the adult moth emerges as we have on the bottom left. Uh, and this, the, the forest tent caterpillar, the males look like this, the females are a little bit bigger. Uh, and the, the adult is the uh, sexually mature stage. This is where all mating occurs. And for males, once they mate, they've served their purpose. The females just have to lay eggs and that's it. So it's often actually the shortest part of the life cycle of, of the moth. Now the characters I mentioned apply to butterflies and moths equally. And so what's the difference between a butterfly and a moth? Uh, well, locally, our butterflies uh, typically rest with their wings over their back like this, uh, this one is, and they typically fly during the day. But the surefire character uh, that you can look for 
is the antenna. They've got these lovely little clubs at the end of the antenna, whereas moths fly during the day, the night, or both, and have either a straight antenna with no club right at the end, or feathery antenna like in the Cecropia moth. And they will hold their wings either flat out like this one over their back, tight together, there's all kinds of different ways that they hold their wings. But really the difference between butterflies and moths is insignificant. It's a quirk of the English language. Most languages that I'm aware of actually don't differentiate between the two. And scientifically, that's really what makes sense. Uh, so if we look at a phylogeny of the Lepidoptera, we've got what are called micromoths, which on average are smaller moths and the ones I'm most interested in. We've got the butterflies sitting here, more micromoths. The butterflies nestle right in the middle of micromoths. And then up here, we've got what are called the macromoths, the moths that are on average bigger and the ones that most people pay attention to. In New York State, we expect around 4,000 species of moths. Currently, we only know of about 3,000. Uh, so we obviously have a lot more to go. Uh, if you look at the pie chart in the bottom right, you'll see butterflies only form a tiny part of that pie. So it's about 1 20th the diversity of Lepidoptera. Um, and you'll see that micromoths make up uh, the lion's share of the rest uh, on the bottom right. Um, and uh, if you look at the map, you'll see that certain areas we know the leps better than others. Uh, I really don't expect there to just be 427 species of moths and butterflies down in the, uh, the southwestern part of the state. It's just been poorly surveyed. Okay, so we now know what Lepidoptera are. I'm gonna use the term Lep, uh, Lepidopteran, Leps, Microleps, Macroleps, uh, or just moth uh, throughout the talk, so be aware of that. Uh, let's talk about some of the predators. And I wanna emphasize that uh, I really don't wanna paint these as the bad guys. These are animals that are taking advantage, advance, uh, advantage of it, an abundant food resource that's out there. Uh, and I get really quite grumpy with people that uh, portray everything that eats their precious butterflies or moths as the bad guys. They're part of nature. So the first group I'll talk about is spiders. There's obviously lots of spiders out there. Uh, they're active right now underneath the snow and they're out hunting for everything from uh, larvae to adults to whatever they can find. Uh, things like this goldenrod crab spider will visit, uh, will hit uh, various Lepidoptera visiting flowers, uh, whereas jumping spiders take a more active role and will seek out um, uh, their, their lab hosts and more about jumping spiders later. There's lots of different insect groups that will feed on laps. Um, dragonflies are sort of odd in that, uh, for those of you that watch dragonflies, you probably don't see them take butterflies or moths very often. And I think part of that is because the way they're built, they've got these gigantic wings that make it hard for a dragonfly that basically hunts by forming its legs into a basket. So it's hard to uh, sort of scoop it up. Um, now, what's a weird exception though, is that this is a black-shouldered spiny leg, which is one of the few dragonflies that I regularly do see take butterflies, but you'll see it's a little different. It's got this really long hind leg with great big spines on it, which hence why it's called black-shouldered spiny legs. And I think this is what it takes to actually take down uh, a larger butterfly or moth. There's other various groups of insects too that will feed on uh, leps. Here is an assassin bug. This is a species of fine downstate, a bit more common, and it is feeding on the caterpillar of a checker spot butterfly. And so what this does is it finds its prey, it jabs it with its beak, uh, which you can see right here, injects proteolytic enzymes to break down the body parts inside there, and then they slurp it up like a big milkshake. Now, not all these predators though, are really vicious looking. Some are rather gracile looking and, and often well camouflaged. Here's a thread-legged assassin bug, which has just nailed a honeysuckle moth, and will do a similar thing to the previous one. And there's various beetles that will do it too. Um, ground beetles most prominently feed on lep, uh, both larvae and adults, but especially larvae. Here's the larva of a ground beetle, and this one was a fun one to shoot in that it was having a grand old time devouring this cutworm. The cutworm, when it started, was actually almost as big as the, the beetle larva itself, and it just started thrashing around and devouring it, making this huge gooey mess of caterpillar and feeding on it. Um, but basically big sloppy eaters. And in certain years where you get big caterpillar outbreaks, there are certain beetles that will lie dormant for 10, 20 years waiting for the next caterpillar outbreak to come and feed on the abundant food. And then wasps, there's a variety of different wasps that will feed on caterpillars. Uh, this is uh, one called Podolonia. 
Uh, the, these photos are, are, photo and the video are from New Mexico, but we have this genus here as well that does very similar things. And if I start the video, you'll see, this is what they're like in real life. They're quite comical. They'll find their caterpillar, sting it to paralyze it, and then drag it back uh, to their hole where they'll provision it for their larvae to feed on. Now, some moths you might be more familiar with are also big caterpillar hunters. Uh, here's a typical paper wasp. And despite ruining your picnics, they will feed on a lot of different uh, caterpillars. And that's one of their main food sources. Uh, in fact, there are caterpillar behavior researchers that suspect that the majority of caterpillar defenses that I'll talk about later are actually targeted against paper wasps. And as someone that runs a light to attract moths, once your local paper, or paper wasp colony finds that you have a moth light and there's moths in the morning, it can be a real pain to get up pre-dawn before they do uh, and clean up your moth sheet and take all the moths away from you. And it's not just um, winged wasps. We got things like ants. Uh, ants can be major predators of caterpillars, especially things like carpenter ants. So here's a New York carpenter ant. And what it's got here, I disturbed it and it dropped its prey. This is the caterpillar of a pug and it's pinched it off here. So it was hunting this on flowers. Um, and carpenter ants, despite them making galleries inside wooden structures, their primary food is actually uh, insects, especially caterpillars. And I challenge you to find any caterpillar anywhere near a carpenter ant nest. There's also various flies that feed on Lepidopter, especially the adults. Uh, on the left, you can see an ant contemplating its life choices. But on the right, you'll see this great big hunk and robber fly. Uh, and this robber fly is about two thirds the length of my index finger. So it's a pretty big fly. They're predatory and they catch things on the wing. So this one, I actually saw it catch its prey. This is a flower moth that was flying around. The robber fly tracked where it was going and grabbed it, wrapped its legs around it and slammed it into the ground and is now sucking it dry with its beak, similar to uh, the bugs I showed you earlier. Now this one might surprise some of you. Uh, one of the more important predators of caterpillars are other caterpillars. Now there are uh, quite often instances of cannibalism with some colonial caterpillars, especially when populations get really high. But there are some like this pinion that actually prefer to feed on other species of caterpillars. So this one will feed on uh, various deciduous trees, but if they're presented with a looper or an inchworm, they will, take, they will go out of the way to try to catch it and eat it because plant food, yeah, it's, it's more if you wanna be on a diet, uh, but meat, that's where you can get really high quality protein in a hurry and is a great source uh, for these caterpillars to grow up faster. And then of course, vertebrates. Um, so I mentioned birds earlier on and, and going through a perilous uh, migration to come here for the abundant food. Uh, but if you look at even some of the birds that you're getting at your bird feeders right now, you're feeding them seeds and suet, most of those will switch to insects in the summer because insects are such an important food source. Uh, and it's not just the caterpillars that I mentioned, they're, they're adult moths that are hunted by things like flycatchers and nightjars that are especially adapted to them. Now, some you might not think about uh, as being important insect predators though, are things like shrews and mice. So here's a short-tailed shrew. Uh, so they're zipping around actually right now underneath the snow, trying to root out anything they can find. They can be very important predators, of especially moth pupae that pupate uh, underground in the winter, um, but they'll eat anything they can find, adult moths, caterpillars, whatever they can get their, their, uh, their mouth on. Uh, but even things like the standard deer mouse, um, you know, deer mice, which they'll eat whatever's available. But if it's a big caterpillar year, Deer mice will actually spend about 50% of their time climbing trees after the abundant caterpillars. And then bats, of course, I have to mention bats. Bats and moths have co-evolved for millions of years. Uh, bats evolving to feed in total darkness on abundant insects at night. And so they use echolocation. Mostly, most of you should be familiar with that where basically they're sending out all, uh, ultrasonic waves that bounce off of, of structures and let them know where the surroundings are, but also where the food is. Um, and when the bats locate their food, they do what's called a, a feeding buzz or feeding trill when they get closer to it to get a more accurate picture of where that host is, the moth is. 
And then what they do is they'll scoop it up either with their wing or with the patagium, which is the flap of skin between their legs and their tail. They'll scoop it up and then flip it into their mouth, doing a backflip all while flying. And they can eat huge numbers of flying moths and other flying insects at night. More about bats later. Now let's scale down and go to something much smaller. Um, here's a velvet mite. I'm sure many of you have seen these before. These are some of the bigger mites you'll see wandering around. They're fuzzy, bright red. They're specialists on insect eggs and some will eat quite a few uh, Lepidoptera eggs as well. But what I really wanna talk about with mites though is their role as parasites. Now, if you look at moths, especially as you get more towards the tropics, you'll see a lot of them have moths or, or have mites on them. Now, in many cases, these mites are just hitchhikers. They're just hitching rides on these moths to get to a new spot. But there are quite a few that will feed on the blood of the moths. And some of the more interesting ones though, are called ear mites. Uh, I'm gonna talk more about moth ears towards the end of the talk, but suffice it to say is that ear mites live in moth ears and they actually damage the ear structure so the moth becomes deaf in that ear. Now, it is of the mite's benefit to make sure the moth is not totally deaf and just deaf in one ear. So what they do is the first mite that finds its way onto the moth leaves a chemical trail. The next mite then smells that chemical trail and knows which side of the moth to go up on and which ear to go into. And eventually they keep reinforcing that trail so all the mites get crowded into one ear and damage that ear and leave the other ear to be perfectly healthy. And I should mention as well with parasites, there's all kinds of different pathogens out there, all kinds of fungi and viruses that can really knock back populations, especially things like fungi. Uh, you know, wet ear can, you know, knock off 90% of a lep population or more. Here's an example. These are Limantria dispar, formerly known as the gypsy moth. I shot these in Plattsburgh last year. And these caterpillars you see have basically turned to liquid mush. So the top has sort of sagged off here. And this is just full of fluid. I think what's killed this one is Entomophagia mammagata, which is a fungus that specializes on caterpillars, but there's a virus called nuclear polyhydrosis virus, which does something pretty similar. I'm not sure exactly which one killed this off, but basically can really decimate a population. All right, let's move on to parasitoids. So a predator is something that basically chops down its host and eats it. A parasite takes a bit from its host but leaves it be. So a mosquito is a parasite to you. It doesn't, doesn't kill you. A parasitoid is sort of in between. So what a parasitoid does is it starts feeding on the host and then when it's done feeding, it kills it in the end. And this might sound kind of cool, but it's actually a really useful strategy. Uh, so as a little mind game here, imagine I was really cool and I put you on a desert island with no food except a live cow. That cow is all you have to feed on. Actually, let's make it a bull. You have no access to milk either. So you've got this bull. So you could kill it right away and you'd have lots of meat. You'd have plenty of meat until it started to spoil. And then you'd be out of food and you'd starve pretty quickly. Or you could do what seems like the cruel option and every day take a few bites out of it. It's not gonna die. It's not gonna like you, but you're gonna have food a lot longer and be able to sustain yourself a lot longer by slowly feeding on the host. And that's indeed what these do. So what we've got pictured here on the screen is called a princess wasp, or ichneumonid. And so this particular species, Theronia, is a specialist on spiny caterpillars. So it's got this great big long ovipositor egg-laying tube to get past the spines. It finds the caterpillar, jabs it with that ovipositor. And in some species, they don't just lay an egg inside of it, but they'll actually inject a virus that they cleave from their own DNA. That virus knocks it out on the immune system of that caterpillar so that wasp larva then can sort of feed and grow without much of an immune response to it. And what that wasp larva has to do then is eat the non-vital organs to keep it alive as long as possible. And then once it's done, it kills it. Here's an example of what some can do to a caterpillar. So what's going on here is this uh, looper got stabbed by a princess wasp earlier on. That larva lived inside here eating non-vital organs. And eventually when it was done its development, it actually didn't kill the host immediately. It cut its way out and spun a cocoon here and it's sitting right there. And it has so changed the behavior of this caterpillar, it's essentially a zombie. And its only role in life right now is to defend that cocoon. So if anything tries to attack that cocoon, this caterpillar will thrash, it will bite, it will defend it until it dies, which will be pretty soon and it will not develop. 
Now we have other really neat parasitoids as well. Uh, this is a group called the Braconids. So here's what the adult looks like in the top middle there. Uh, usually a little smaller than princess wasps on average. And what's happened with both of these caterpillars is you had a single Braconid jab it, lay a single egg, and that egg is what we call polyembryonic, which means you have a single egg that then hatches into a whole bunch of larvae, which feed on the inside of the caterpillar, again, not hitting the vital organs. And on the left of the sporn worm, the, the larvae have done feeding and they've come out and spun cocoons on the outside. And each of these cocoons will have a wasp emerge from it. Uh, on the right is a different caterpillar. This had a different type of braconid on it. And what this one did is the larvae fed the inside of it, turned it into Swiss cheese, and they all cut their way out and pupated on the ground instead. Now, a lot of the diversity in parasitoids, though, is in tiny wasps, what we call the microhymenoptera. And these are tiny. Uh, this particular one here you can see is, a, is at the limit of my camera. Uh, and these are about a millimeter, two millimeters in length from this particular species. And what these are on, this is the egg mass of Lymantra dispar, formerly known as the gypsy moth. Uh, these you can find this time of year on tree trunks, uh, this fuzzy mass. And what you'll notice, you'll see these pock marks in it. So what has happened there is one of these wasps laid an egg on one of these Lymantria eggs. Its larva hatched and spent its entire development inside the single moth egg, feeding on the insides, and then developed as an adult later, creating this pockmark, which is basically a hollowed out egg. So when you look at the next egg mass that you see of these on tree trunks, look for pockmarks. And the more pockmarks you see, the more parasitized that egg mass is. And it's not just wasps that, that uh, are the important parasitoids here. Flies are very, very important. And the most important group of flies are called the parasitic flies, the cachinids. Uh, here's a common one in the springtime called Epalpa signifier. Uh, this is a specialist on cutworms and they'll fly around in the early spring trying to find a caterpillar lay their eggs on it, and then they do a similar thing to the princess wasp where they break into the larva and eat the non-vital organs. And if you ever want to see how common uh, parasitic flies are, just look at caterpillars around you. Here we have a, a cutworm. If you see oblong things that are white like this, typically near the head, these are, these are the eggs of a parasitic fly. Again, these eggs will hatch, they'll burrow in and feed on the caterpillar itself. Now, there are some parasitic flies that have different strategies for getting uh, to their host. So this is one called a Dexiaine tachinid. And what it does is it doesn't find its host. What it does is it lays thousands and thousands and thousands of eggs all over foliage. And these eggs are what we call microtype eggs. They're very, very small with a hard shell. And they lay so many eggs in the hopes that a caterpillar accidentally eats them. And if a caterpillar accidentally eats them, the eggshells are so resistant that the mandibles don't break it, it gets into the gut. And once digestive enzymes hit it, that's when it's triggered to hatch into that maggot that will then feed on the insides and you know the rest of the story. All right, so those are some of the major predators, parasites and parasitoids of Lepidoptera. And I just wanted to drop a quick note here that it's not just animals and fungi and pathogens that are, are knocking down these Lepidoptera. There's all kinds of other things that are knocking back their populations. Uh, a lot of abiotic factors, things like weather. So a heavy rainstorm or a high wind or a badly placed frost can knock off 99% of a population. And then plants themselves, the plants that they're feeding on, they're not defenseless. These plants are producing all kinds of toxins to try to slow the growth of those caterpillars to keep them alive longer to increase the chance that a predator or a parasite finds them. But now let's look at some of the defenses that these leps have. Uh, so here's a type of cutworm called felsia. Now felsia, you'll see it's pretty well camouflaged in grassy habitats where it lives. What's really neat though, and one of the important defenses right off the bat of lepidopterans is it's hard to grab. They are slippery. If you try to grab this with your fingers, it will slide through. Not just that, but it's gonna burrow down into the grass and act like a little mouse and just burrow out, out of the way and you won't find it again. And these deciduous scales, they rub right off and make them basically impossible to catch. So the scales themselves are a defense, but not just from predators trying to grab them. One of the hypotheses of the big benefits of scales early on was against spider webs. And when you think about it with all these moths flying around uh, after dark or even during the day, these butterflies and moths, um, they're fumbling around 
and you can't see a spider web at night, and it's very easy to bump into one. But with this covering of deciduous scales, these scales will stick to that spider web, and you've got a good chance to flee. And when you think about it, how often do you see butterflies and moths and spider webs? It's not very often. Uh, they do catch them, but it's relatively rare compared to other insects. Now, this example I'm going to give you, this one is pure speculation. I've not seen this in the, in the literature anywhere, so I could be uh, completely out to lunch here. Um, but I, I see a potential avenue of research for someone. And that is, there's several lineages of micromoths that have these crazy hindlegs. So first of all, this is a moth that has one of the most amazing names. It's called Schreckensteinia fistelliella, uh, the blackberry skeletonizer. And the adults have these crazy long hind legs with crazy long uh, spurs on the side here. These spurs are movable that look like the old style TV antennae. And they hold them up from the body at a 45 degree angle. And I've always wondered why. There's many lineages that do this. Why do they do this? And recently I was pondering it and I thought, you know, I bet it's a physical barrier for a prayer to leap on this. First of all, if it leaps back here, it's got the slippery wings and it's not going to get anywhere. If it leaps here, it's going to hit this leg. And yeah, I can grab the leg, but these legs fall off very easily. So it would be a nice decoy. So really the predator is left to attacking from the front where the eyes are and increase the chance uh, that the moth will see it. So just my hypothesis here. I don't know if it's been published on, but I've not seen anywhere. Be curious if anybody knows anything further about that. Now, a common defense you'll see in caterpillars, I'm sure you've all seen this before, when you disturb a caterpillar, they will drop down. They don't just drop to their doom. They're producing silk. So as they're feeding, as they're moving, they're laying down a little line of silk so that they can drop off in a hurry on the silken drag line. Now, this silk is, built, is made out of salivary glands, which are some of the most active uh, protein synthesizing organs known in the animal kingdom. They produce uh, two chemicals, fibroin and sericin, which combined create this very fast forming uh, silk. Now, this is a very important strategy for a larva. Picture this living up in the canopy of a tree and a bird disturbs it. Well, if it just falls, the fall is probably not going to hurt it because of the way physics works, but it's not gonna make it back up. It's got that incredible distance, first of all, so it'd have to expend a lot of energy to get back up to the canopy. But second, you've got predators all along the way that are ready to hit that while it's trying to get away. So this silk line is very, very important. So they can drop down a little ways, get out of sight of the predator, and then haul themselves back up relatively rapidly once the danger has, has disappeared. Now, I'm sure that many of you realize that in this talk, I'm gonna to have to talk about camouflage because it's very important in both butterflies and moths. Uh, and I'm going to show you some pretty cool examples. But uh, I want to really emphasize that context is important for camouflage. So everyone can see that there's a butterfly here. This is a gray comma. You'll find them actually, if we start getting warm days, uh, eventually you'll see this even out when it's cold out. They, they overwinter as adults. It's obviously really well camouflaged. Either as a leaf or bark, whatever it is, it doesn't look like food. But because I've zoomed right in and I've centered it, it is obvious where that is. But in nature, that's not how it works. In nature, you have something more like this. Okay, so I'm going to try something here. I've never done this in the talk before. This is an activity for you to do at home. Picture this. You are a predator. You need to find food, both for you and for your offspring that you're trying to rear. And you don't want to waste your time. So what I want you to do, look at each picture. Tell me how many moths, or keep tracking your head. I don't need to, to, for you to tell me right now. You can tell me later if you like. Keep tracking your head. How many moths, caterpillars, pupae, eggs, whatever is edible, how many do you see in each picture? Keep track of both numbers, uh, and I'll get back to you. And now keep in mind that while you're just playing Where's, where's Waldo, if this was a real world and you were uh, some sort of predator looking for a meal, you're also watching for predators around you that could eat you. You also don't wanna waste your time because this is life or death here. And stop. All right, now you should have two numbers in your head, how many you saw on the left and how many in the saw, saw on the right. And I've got a little formula for you. So in the end, your final score, if it's below five, you didn't make it. Sorry, you're not an efficient predator. If it's above five, uh, great job. You're an efficient predator. So. How you're going to do the math in your head is take your first number, 
Add it to the second number. All right, you got that so far? Probably not a big number. Multiply it by zero. That's because this was a trick. There are no moths in these photographs. And that is how nature works. I tricked you because you can't predict that there's even anything there for you to eat. And that is the life of a predator. It's repeated failure after failure. Um, and so keep that in mind when I show you pictures of things that are camouflaged like this. This is not camouflage right now because I have both turned it over and centered it and zoomed right in on it. In real life, this caterpillar would be completely hidden because it's employing something called counter shading. And that is, you'll see how the top part of it here is very pale compared to the bottom part, which is quite a bit darker. Now, normally this thing is upside down underneath a leaf where you've got a shadow that is here, a shadow that makes this part about this dark. And this is now the lighter part. So it eventually actually completely gets rid of the shadow. And you can think if you look at uh, your finger and how you've got a shadow underneath, picture you just taking that palette and switching it and you could get rid of the shadow by what's called counter shading. Now shadows are the enemy of caterpillar because they give away where you are. And some caterpillars have really interesting ways for getting rid of shadows. Here's the caterpillar of a large polypi. So first of all, these typically rest on the trunks of conifers, especially the young bark of Eastern white pine. And for those of you know, that know Eastern white pine, it looks like that. Plus they've got these lobes that bend down to reach the substrate and these fine hairs that eliminate the shadow. In fact, the only reason I ever saw this caterpillar is it sat on the wrong thing. It was just sitting on a rock below a white pine. Uh, but normally you're probably passing by these all the time and just never seeing them. And the same goes for adults too. So here is the caterpillar of a white streak prominent. The head is down here, here's some of the legs, but all these fluffy scales here that help disguise its shadow. So exceptional camouflage. And you don't see these for a reason because camouflage is amazing. But the thing to remember with camouflage, uh, as the caterpillar or adult that's, you know, depending on camouflage, you're only camouflaged if you're not moving. So this restricts when you can be active. So if you're a caterpillar, it means you can only eat at night when things are not depending on vision to find you. And that means you're eating both at a colder time of day, so your metabolism runs slower, and it also restricts the number of hours a day you can feed. So there are uh, some, some negatives to depending on camouflage. Now here's a moth that some of you might recognize. This is called the peppered moth or salt and pepper looper. This is that standard example from way back uh, in Europe that demonstrated industrial melanism. A moth that's polymorphic where uh, some forms look like this, but in Europe, they're usually a bit paler. Uh, and then there's dark morphs. And once pollution took over and made the trees black, it, the melanic form benefited because it was better camouflage. So the standard story we've all heard. Now this species you can find in your backyard. It's, it's relatively common here in New York state. Um, and it's not the only example of a moth that does that. Here's a much more common one that you're gonna start seeing at the end of March and early April. Uh, this is called the half-wing Figelia titia. On the left, that's the typical form that's most common here. Uh, and at any given place between 60% and 95% of them are this morph. The, the melanic morph on the right varies in abundance. Um, now, I really, uh, there's a potential interesting study here for some to do. I really wonder if that, the dark morph seems to be common in some areas rather than others. And I wonder if it correlates with things like having lots of black cherry, which has really dark bark, and this would be better camouflaged than the white leaves, uh, or what tree species are there. So anyways, we have our own examples of prep moths, and it's not just those species. There's others that do this. Now, if you don't have your own camouflage built in, you can build your own camouflage. So here is what's called the camouflage looper or garbage caterpillar. This is an inchworm, there it is right there. And what it's done is you can see it's been eating the ray flowers on these flea banes and clipping them off and sticking them to its back. And when they're fresh, this would just look like a little clump of flower. And this is a very easy caterpillar to find once you know what to look for. And in my backyard, just right out here, the easy way to look for them is look at clumps of erigeron, the, the flea banes, and see ones where the, the ray flowers have been eaten. And it's surprising how difficult it is to see this caterpillar. I'll sometimes see a clump of them where I know there's a caterpillar there. It'll take me a solid minute or two to find the actual caterpillar itself because the camouflage can be so amazing. 
And then sometimes you just really don't know what, what it's camouflaged at until you see it in context. So this is the red dotted glyph. This is one where I always wondered why it's green with red polka dots. Like, come on, that is not camouflaged until you see it in its natural habitat and not on a wall at a light. And that is, it likes to rest on branches covered in lichens that have these lovely red apothecial escoma here with the white rim, which match these nice spots and sometimes they're dark. And they, they incredibly disappear in that habitat. And so that's why you probably don't see them. Uh, but even that, even if it doesn't sit on a lichen covered branch, these lichens are shed by anything that walks in like squirrels or whatnot. So there's chunks of lichen lying around all over. So it just looks like a piece of lichen, even if it's not sitting amongst them. And other ones like this, if you look at um, some of the micro moths that feed on conifers, you'll see this pattern uh, evolutionary has converged in a lot of different groups. Uh, this one's called Eucopina Uh the white pine flower borer, I believe it's called. Uh, and what's interesting is that most of these fly in late spring, early summer, and they look very much like the debris you see below in eastern white pine or a lot of other conifers. They lose the male staminate cones, they sh shed from the tree in the thousands, and so you see these embedded in foliage and all over the ground, and the moths look strikingly like that when you're not zoomed in like I am here. And of course, there's a lot that mimic, the, mimic bird poop, and for some reason, birds leave that alone. Here's the caterpillar of either a viceroy or a white admiral, uh, and you can see it just looks like this rather disgusting, regurgitant fecal pile of nastiness. Uh, and birds will leave that alone because it does not look appetizing. And even adult moths will do this too. This is a moth called Antiotrica. Uh, here's a pair mating, but at rest um, from a distance, they look like really fresh wet bird poop, uh, especially on a nice misty morning like this one that I photographed. Um, and the thing is, uh, when you're out looking for moths like, like I regularly do and you should too, um, you will be disappointed as to how common bird poop actually is. And when you think you find a moth and it turns into actually be bird poop, the camouflage is really quite striking. All right, now here's an interesting scenario. So, so let's say you've got an insect that becomes really abundant. This moth is the black-headed budworm, uh, and it can be very common in coniferous forests, especially up in the Adirondacks and places north. Now, if you're a predator, a visual predator, like a paper wasp or a bird, it's of your benefit to learn this pattern so you recognize it and pick it out easier in the environment. So to counteract that, some moths uh, will have some variation. So sometimes you get morphs that look like this. And this is one I shot in my backyard that you can see is a slight variation of the pattern. So it's a little different, but you know, birds could, yeah, okay. Birds are kind of smart. They could learn that pattern too. But then you also find morphs that look like this. Okay, well, there's, there's another pattern to learn. Uh, but then if you look at the whole of the population, this moth is incredibly variable. These are all the same species. In fact, siblings uh, can look as, as different, different as this banded one and striped one. So they have polymorphism built into the genetics as a strategy to reduce the chance that a predator will learn what they look like. And you'll see this also in caterpillars quite a bit, especially in yeah, a lot of- We might have them in the back. Really? Yeah, they're not cold though. Yeah. All right. And then moving on to eye spots. So we were all familiar with eye spots. Um, now, again, in context, you have to picture this. So this is a polyphemus moth, which is one of our bigger moths. Um, it's almost as big as, as my hand. And basically, if you're a small bird, these eye spots are much bigger than your eyes. And they can be kind of terrifying, uh, especially if you see them suddenly. But not all eye spots look like great big vertebrate eyes and are very obvious. Here's some that you'll see in a larva. So this is the caterpillar of a tiger swallowtail. Now picture this, you're a bird, you come across this leaf shelter and you've investigated, all of a sudden this head pops up and it's got these weird eyes with angry looking eyebrows. So it looks like it means business. But let's say, okay, you, you might be able to eat that. Yeah, the eyes are bigger than yours, but so what? Well, if that doesn't work, this caterpillar will rear its head up and all of a sudden this great big bright red forked tongue called an osmaterium will flick in and out just like a snake's tongue and spew forth this really putrid smelling substance that will solidify you not eating this caterpillar. But there are other eyes that can be deceptive. So here is a tiny 
uh, rock-loving moth. This is a species you'll find very commonly along some of the streams uh, in the Ithaca area. Now, it clearly doesn't have eye spots like the other two, but here's a common thing you'll see in a lot of micromoths are these silvery and black patterns that to your eye might not look like eye spots, but to a jumping spider, they sure do. In fact, if you line them up, they match up pretty nicely with what a jumping spider head looks like. And if you're a jumping spider wanting to eat a small moth, this is where you'd go. You would want to attack the head. And this is just a chunk of wing. The moth can do without that. It wants to deflect away from its real head and over here. And again, you'll see these eye spots on a lot of different micromoths. And some actually will have aggressive looking eyes. So here is a moth called the Tabena uh, metal mark moth. And so here you can see, here are the eye arrangements from a spider, but they're more down head on and more of an aggressive posture. And some of the tropic ones even have fake spider legs to make it look like they're being aggressive towards the spider. And this moth will actually rotate around um, to potentially face a predator. So this can actually be intimidating for a jumping spider. And then there's distractions. So you'll see a lot of butterflies that have eye spots on the outside of the wings, but some will have a whole fake head. So here's an Acadian hair streak. Now what's neat if you watch hair streaks, you'll see that as soon as they land on something, they'll take their hind wings and rub them back and forth. And that will make these fake antennae, these tails pair up and look just like antennae. They've got a fake head over here and all these, this complicated stuff here. But the real stuff you'll see, the legs and the real antennae all have a broken up outline so they're hard track. Basically all the markings are pointing you towards the tail end of the wing and saying, hey, my head is over here. And some moths even take this further. There's a group of moths called the twirlers that habitually, some will have a fake head on their butt. And when they land, just to confuse any ambush predator, they land, they spin around a few times, so you can't tell which way is forward, and then rest. And it's, it's, it's really neat watching that, that twirling behavior. And then underwings. So many of you will be familiar with underwings. They have a startle response. So here is an Ultronia underwing. And the standard story you're often told is, oh, bird finds an underwing, boo, scary, yay, predator flies away. Eh, probably not. The more likely scenario is bird finds this, is startled by this bright red and black coloration that shows up. And that buys the moth maybe a second, maybe two. That's it. Birds are a little smarter than that usually. But that is enough time for this moth to take flight. Now, when it's in flight, the undersides of both wings and also the upper sides of the hind wings are boldly patterned, black and white or black and red or black and yellow. And that's what the predator's eyes lock on. You are now chasing this bold pattern that's flying very erratically. Now, all this moth has to do is fly around a tree, close up its wings, and that bold pattern is gone. And hopefully, the bird's search image is now looking for that bold pattern and not back to the camouflage. And then there's iridescent insects. And iridescent insects uh, always bug me and I could never really figure out why were they were this color. But what it does in bright sunlight, it actually is kind of dazzling and kind of blinding. It actually makes it very difficult to follow and very difficult to catch for, for aerial predators. Uh, so you'll see that it's pretty much just uh, flying insects that have iridescence like this uh, clover case bearer. Now there are predators that will find them based on smell. So princess wasps especially will smell caterpillar poop. When they find caterpillar poop, they know to fly up to find where the caterpillar is feeding and they can sting it. Well, some caterpillars avoid this problem, uh, like in this painted lichen moth. What it does is it has what's called an anal tubercle. And the anal tubercle, when it's ready to poop, it holds the poop sort of like this, builds up the blood pressure, and then poof, fires off that poop a great distance away. So scatter its feces away so that predators can't find it easily. Now, this photo, I just want to stop here for a minute because uh, I initially hated this photo when I took it because I couldn't get the lighting right. But I think this really uh, emphasizes what's really important about the message I'm trying to get across here, especially with camouflage, is that context is important. This is a caterpillar that lives down in the forest floor where light is dappled. And so you'll see some parts that are bright, some parts that are dark, the pattern's complicated. It's got these fine fringes to break up its shadow. It is very well hidden. And what's really neat is that some predators, especially birds, will look for feeding sign that caterpillars have been eating a leaf and then find the caterpillar that way. This caterpillar avoids that by feeding at night up in the canopy and then during the day climbing down and hiding on a stem. 
And other ones will actually conceal their feeding, some like the carpets. The caterpillars will actually, this is a maple leaf, will actually nibble off the lobes to make a nice rounded leaf so that feeding sign's not obvious. And here's one where it's actually dug the or eaten the furrows quite a bit deeper to keep it nice and symmetrical so it's not obvious where that feeding sign is, just to trick predators. And then, of course, we've got uh, various types of nests they can produce. So here's eastern tent caterpillar. The nests have a lot of benefits, uh, like thermoregulation, a place to hide during bad weather, things like that. But some of the nests will actually have additional strategies. This is uh, created by a moth called diarycteriff, which feeds on conifers. And here's its nest. It's this big, nasty mess of silk and feces that silk together. So if you're a predator, you've got to dig through this to try to find that caterpillar. And then when you find it, as I did here, it thrashes around and eventually jumps out of the tree on a silk drag line. So it's often just not worth your effort. And then leaf miners. Uh, here is a leaf miner in poison ivy, poison ivy leaf miner. It's a, here's the caterpillar, what it looks like. Uh, so it is between the upper and lower layer of the leaf, feeding on the inside leaf, like the inside of a sandwich. And what they'll do to protect themselves from princess wasps, like this one up above here, admittedly this one's probably not, it's parasites way too big, uh, will create a structure called a nidus where the, the plant tissue is left purposely thick. When a parasitoid shows up, they flee for that as an area where they can't puncture through to get the larva. And some of these leaf miners, actually their whole mind pretty much is a nidus. This is one you can find very commonly in the summer, basswood square blotch miner, where basically a tiny caterpillar has fed in the middle of the leaf and most of this leaf is too thick for a parasite to get and basically impossible for a bird to get to, unless you're a chickadee. Black-capped chickadees actually have a modification of two different muscle groups in their legs that enable them to hang upside down and hunt efficiently. So chickadees are one of the few things that eat leaf miners on the undersides of leaves. They can peck those leaf mines and easily get that caterpillar in a place where it's vulnerable. Other ones like this pus caterpillar use uh, uh, various chemicals to defend themselves. So this one I poked in the head and it stuck at this nasty uh, hind leg modified to a tentacle that has a stink to it. And if that doesn't work, it rears up its head, which has uh, red, black, and white concentric rings around. It looks absolutely terrifying. And it has a little gun underneath its mouth on its thorax that squirts acid in the face of any potential predator. Now some, uh, typically a good advice I can give you is someone that's eaten a lot of different species of moths. If a moth is not camouflaged, it probably tastes bad. And I can, this is the, one of the worst, worst moths I've ever eaten, the rosy maple moth. Um, I know other animals can eat them. I can't, these are terrible tasting. And you can kind of judge that by the colors of them. But some are downright toxic. Uh, so here is a monarch butterfly. We all know the story of them sequestering uh, cardiac glycosides from milkweeds, um, but, the birds tend not to really discover that until they've tried one. And so these butterflies are pretty tough, but sometimes you want the predator to know without actually biting into you. So things like this virgin tiger moth, uh, this is one I poked it as well, and you'll see it form this bubble from a gland in its prothorax, uh, and it's bubbling forth this nasty smelling alkaloid mix, uh, which would make it completely distasteful. So you just have to taste this caterpillar. You don't actually have to bite it to realize you don't want to eat this. And some can actually adjust the poisons on the inside. So this is the caterpillar of a tiger moth. And what's interesting is when it's, on, when it's been parasitized by a parasitic fly, what it will do is it'll switch from eating a nutritious, a nutritious plant to a plant that's really toxic and basically perform chemotherapy on itself and basically try to poison out that larva. And once it's killed that fly larva from eating that poisonous plant, then it tries to recover by switching to a much healthier plant to eat. And then of course there's mimicry and some of it is reinforcing toxicity. So here's a painted lichen moth, which stores various chemicals from the lichens that the caterpillar eats. Uh, and over here is a firefly, which the, the mimicry is reinforced here. Both are equally toxic and predators know to avoid those things. But some uh, use mimicry to deceive. So here are three different types of moths that cannot sting you, even though the one in the bottom right has a fake stinger, but will act and look like bees and wasps uh, to defend themselves. And a lot of predators will leave them alone for that reason. And just rounding out here with these uh, caterpillar defenses, um, spines. It's pretty obvious what spines are for. You don't want to eat this thing. But with a lot of spiny caterpillars, there's safety in numbers. You'll often see them in aggregate groups like these morning cloak caterpillars, 
where this is much more intimidating than a single caterpillar to see this on a branch. And some spines are even venomous, like this spiny oak slug, where it feels like a bee sting if you, if you accidentally touch this. And some hairy caterpillars can actually be somewhat dangerous too. Um, this is a white marked tussock moth. And what's neat is you'll see these little red buttons on its back. These are glands that secrete this really nasty chemical. And what it does is actually grooms itself with these paddle-shaped hairs. Uh, it bends back and grooms them on these to make these paddles really nasty and foul tasting and they could whack these at a potential predator. But also all of these hairs are minutely barbed and break really easily. So if you pop this in your mouth, these hairs are gonna embed in your mouth and really, really irritate. So basically you have to be specially adapted to eat these hairy caterpillars. And some have armor on. This is uh, a button slug, which is a type of caterpillar. Uh, and it might not look like much, but the texture of this, if you were to tap it, it's got the texture of a plastic bead. It is rock hard, it is solid. Uh, most predators are not gonna be able to safely eat this. And then some will even reinforce it with sound. This is the caterpillar of a promethea moth, uh, one of the giant silk moths. Now, to defend itself, it regurgitates a lot of nastiness. And with a caterpillar this big, it can regurgitate a lot. Uh, but it doesn't want to always have to regurgitate at lunch. So what it does is it warns you first. What it does is it takes its mandibles and makes this loud shearing noise that you can actually hear, and then it barfs on you. And with the sound, it's actually so efficient that predators learn it very quickly and know that when they hear that mandible sound, they're about to get barfed on and they'll back away before the caterpillar has to unload on it. And then bats. Let's round off and finally talk about bats. So bats, obviously, as we talked about, are adapted to eating moths at night using echolocation. Now, for some moths, this is a problem. This is an ermine moth, and you can see it's obviously not camouflaged, and it's toxic, and it's advertising that by, by you know, pretty obviously. But echolocation does not pick up colors. So how does it warn bats that it's toxic? Well, this is a study that just came out three years ago. If you look at the hind wing of this moth, so here's, here's the far wing, here's the hind wing. Uh, it's got this little pale area here that has no scales on it. And it's a structure we call an aeroelastic timble. And what this is, is you picture taking a piece of sheet metal between your two hands and wobbling it back and forth, like boom, 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 boom. With that on the microscale to make an ultrasonic sound. So every time this moth takes a wing beat, it's sending out one of these boom, boom, that is a sound that bats pick up and they know that sound means it, don't eat that, you're not gonna enjoy it. So they're defending themselves that way. And there's a lot of micro moths that have it. We're just starting to discover how widespread these aeroelastic timbles are. Uh, and some look like they're on moths that are completely edible. So maybe there's even some deception involved there. We're still at the early stages. Some moths like this Luna moth have these weird modified tails. And it's been shown also in very recent research uh, that these tails deflect the sonar of bats to make it hard for the moth or the bat to actually catch the moth. And if you clip the tails off of a little moth, it can still fly, but bats have a much greater chance of catching them. Now, one of the more amazing uh, strategies that moths have for uh, defending themselves against bats are ears. So remember we talked about ear mites. Well, here's what the ear of a moth looks like. And they're in various places, but on uh, a lot of moths, they're on the side of the body. So here we've got the head of a tiger moth. There's the thorax, here's the abdomen. One leg here, one leg here, one leg here, four wing hind, just so you see where we are. This is its ear. Now its ear is sensitive to the bat species in the area. In fact, if you translocate a, a moth to a, a place uh, that has different types of bats, it's not as well adapted to hearing those, those bats. Um, and with some moths, they actually will just take evasive maneuvers when bats are close. Other ones will plunge from the sky, but other ones have their own strategies. So here's a delicate sycnia, a, quite a toxic moth. Uh, it's got various cardenolides that sequesters from feeding on dog bane. And so it warns uh, bats uh, by actually sending out their own sound. So they've got um, what's called a timbal on the side of the body. And the timbal is sort of like that um, uh, structure we talked about with micro moths, except they can control it and they can yell back at the bat saying, you don't want to eat me. And bats learn quickly that if it's making that sound, you don't want to eat it. And there's even some moths, I'm not sure if any of our local ones do this, but some of the tiger moths uh, further south will actually jam the sonar of bats by producing sounds so high, of such high frequency that the bats can't even detect uh, where they are. All right, so 
we talk about a variety of different things today. We talk about what moths and butterflies are, the Lepidoptera. We talk about all the different types of predators and parasites and parasitoids that want to take advantage of this abundant food resource. And then we talk about some of the strategies that uh, moths and butterflies have to try to defend themselves against these predators. And I hope you have a great appreciation for some of these defense strategies, but I really want to end on, on one more uh, important note here, and that is in putting this talk together, there's very few species I can talk about because we know so little about the species of our area. Uh, so any keen naturalist out there observing moths or caterpillars can very likely make a significant discovery and the discoveries are being made every day. So just keep in mind that I picked very few examples because they are kind of limited, but there's so much more out there. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. Have a good night. Thank you, Jason. That was great. Um, and we will uh, go to um, uh, questions, which we'll mostly do in um, uh, the uh, uh, peer reviewed breakout groups, which will just send you into breakout groups for a few minutes. But there is one question in the chat that we'll, uh, we'll address first. And that is um, one that I probably can't quite pronounce. Was Lem Lamentria dispar given a new common name yet? Uh, so Lamentria dispar, formerly known as a gypsy moth, um, there was a push to give it a, a new common name. Um, I've heard a rumor. I don't know how it truly is. I don't know if I should repeat it or not. I think it might be called the spongy moth now or something like that. Not a name that I would have chosen, but I'm just me. Uh, I think that might be it, but I don't think it's been made official yet. Okay. Okay, and what we're going to do next <coughs> is um, just send you off to breakout groups for um, for about six minutes. I think it's eight thirty four right now. Um, we've got a fifty three people, um, so we'll go into uh, nine breakout groups. And what we'll have you do there is this. Let me share my screen, and I'll also put a link for uh, some Google Slides with this info in it. Um, where you'll just uh, um, take a few minutes to introduce yourself to one another um, uh, and uh, come up with a question for your group. Um, it's a large enough crowd that um, that way everybody gets an opportunity to uh, uh, speak and um, the questions also come back better when we do it this way. So um, we're going to send you off to breakout groups. Uh, Jason, I'll note that I think you'll get sent off to a breakout group as well. So just come right back so you can take a, take a sip and a breath. And uh, um, we will have you go in there uh, in those breakout groups for six minutes to come up with a question in your group. And then we'll um, go through those. And I'm actually going to change it to eight groups so that we can get through them quicker. So um, I'm sending you off to uh, breakout groups now. And uh, we will give you six minutes for that. There we go. That was great. You're muted. <laughs> One of these days I'm going to learn. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Not like I'm new to this. Um, yeah, it, it, as always with these talks, it, it's always way too big. And the hardest thing is just squishing it down. Yeah, uh, I thought it was great. And then I'm going to uh, send that link off. So how many uh, participants ended up showing up? Um, the biggest number I saw at one point was 92, I think. Nice. Yeah, so that's, that's the second best crowd we've ever had. Pretty good. Actually, start a timer if you want to do that. Yeah. 
So what are you drinking tonight? I got, I went high test or I went fancy today with the impact French. They're delicious. You're muted again. <laughs> I, I'm drinking an old oh, favorite yeah. of mine. Oh yeah, Southern I love tier. Southern Tier. Um, who is the uh, sponsoring brewery for this? Uh, Resurgence in Buffalo. Okay. I, I am PR. I for a long time I was PRI's only uh, telecommuter, and I live in Buffalo. And uh, oh wow, <laughs> this uh, um, this program actually grew out of I uh, uh, taught a graduate. Uh, seminar in informal science education at UB in the fall of 2019. And one of the students for a project for the course um, created the Buffalo Science in the Pub that the first session was in January of 2020. <laughs> 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 and then the second session was in February of 2020. And then March of 2020 was March of 2020. So uh, we went uh, uh, we went virtual starting, starting then. Um, crazy but it's uh it has helped keep my sanity <laughs> it's been an awful lot of fun really interesting uh set of different folks talking about a wide range of really interesting things i haven't we haven't had a boring one yet <laughs> nice yeah <coughs> so. and we you know, the size of the group has varied from i think the smallest one was 10 to 99 and uh, probably typical is 25 or something. But, uh, we went, um, we are trying to go back to the actual pub, which we've been trying since August, which we had one in August. So the, the, so we're doing one virtual session a month and one, um, one, live streamed from the pub is the idea but we've mm -hmm. only had two i think live streamed from the pub because the pandemic has not been cooperative but I well unless there's another surprise in store things are looking good yeah i think the a month from uh or the end of this month rather the one that i'm doing on the the 23rd i think it's the 23rd um i'm planning to be back in the pub so we will see And one minute warning. Well, if I've got time, I might just grab one more beer. I'm running low. All right. You're muted. <laughs> That's funny. Even though I was unmuted in the breakout room, it mutes you again when you come back. Uh, that there are nine minutes and 30 seconds left in the. Oh, yeah. It, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I always forget that. to reset that timer. So I just broadcast a message that said I'm about to click the thing that gets oh, okay. minute, and I just clicked it. So. All righty. You should. Uh, Filtering back, uh, Jason went to grab a beer. <laughs> <laughs> so I have clicked the button, which gives them one more minute. I did that about 10 yeah. seconds ago or something. So we had a question from our group, which was whether you want, you're going to ask for questions to be spoken or put into the chat. I think I will ask them to be spoken. I will just, I will call them out. I've got, um, you know, I can see who's in each group. So oh, okay. pronounce enough names to <laughs> be able to call it. Although it looks like actually one room any, anyway ended up with just one person in it. <laughs> it's our filtering back in, they're closing in three seconds. Sorry, Emma, that you ended up in a room by yourself. I don't know where everybody went. A couple of people that happened to. Okay. So folks should mostly be back from uh, the breakout rooms. 
and we'll just uh, I, I will I will call from room to room to ask folks to uh, um, give us their question. Uh, so, room one was Donald, Maria, and Nico. Does uh, someone from room one share your question? I think Donald had a few cool questions. Okay. Uh, one question with with all the huge number of moths and larvae and so forth, how many reach maturity and re to reproduce? Very few. <laughs> On average, it's just enough to replace uh, the population. So when uh, so with leps, you're typically producing you know a few hundred eggs per female. Well, most of those eggs are going to fail, and of those larvae, most of those larvae are going to fail. Then most of the pupae will fail, and then hopefully a few male or adults will mate and uh, produce offspring. Now, if conditions change, though, you can have a massive outbreak in a hurry. And you've seen that with things like Lymetri dispar, the former gypsy moth, uh, where they can build into huge numbers, uh, seemingly instantaneously. Mm -hmm. um, and so the short answer is almost everything dies. Okay. <laughs> okay, um, and we'll just we'll take one question uh, per group initially and see if uh, see how time goes. And Emma, it looks like you were by yourself in room two. Do you have a question? And you're muted right now. You unmuted. Now. Oh, I don't have a question. Okay, and uh, room three was uh, Carolyn and Eva. Is there a question from room three? Um. I, I, uh, Carol, uh, came up with a question, but I, I also just come up, came up with a question right now, uh, which is, um, do a lot of moth eggs have like, uh, changes in, in camouflage and, and odd defensive structures, um, as well as their, their larvae and, and pupa and stuff? Um, hi, Anne. good to see you. Um, so maybe, um, so the common ones I can think of off the top of my head is there are a bunch where the female will put defensive structures on them. So I showed you the life cycle slide had eggs in this, what's initially a frothy mass that then hardens into a structure that's hard to break into. Uh, things like the Lymetri dispar, they cover the egg mass in these urticating scales that are really irritating to sensitive skin, so you wouldn't want to eat them. Beyond that, some will in, uh, insert them into plants. So they're kind of hidden, but not a lot. It's not so common in leps. Um, and then a lot, I, th I can't think of any defense off the top of my head, but I'm sure, I'm sure there are some. It's just, we really don't know. Okay. And that was actually room five because there are similarly named people. So room three is Carolyn and Eva. Do they have a question? Yes. 